Hello everyone and welcome to this UK Data Service webinar introducing Hadoop. I see there's still a lot of people joining so I'm going to give it a couple of more seconds until we actually start the presentation. Um, but there's already a lot of you on so thank you for joining. Okay, let's just start with some introductions in the meantime. So I am Margarita, I work for the UK Data Service and I'm based um, at JISC in Manchester. And presenting today is Peter Smythe. He is a research associate working for the UK Data Service as well and he is based at the University of Manchester. Just a few things before we start. Um, you have a menu on the, right, on the top right corner of your screen, which hopefully you have had time to familiarize yourself with. You can collapse and expand it using the uh, red arrow. And um, you can type in comments and questions under and the questions box. Um, we probably won't be able to answer them until the end of the uh, presentation, but if you do have a comment during the presentation, please do. Um, write it to us and uh, all attendees are muted so we won't be able to hear you. Um, we are recording this webinar so if everything goes smoothly it will, the recording will be available on our uh, website. It will be under news and events and then past events. And last thing is under handouts I have uploaded the slideshow in PDF format so if you do want to download it you can do so now and if you want to write comments on it, you can do that, but the slides will be available on the past event page too. Right, so before I hand over to Peter, I'd just like to see if all of you can hear me, so I'm going to launch a poll, just to check that you can all hear me okay. <coughs> okay, it seems all of you at the moment can hear me. All some strugglers, um, but most of you have voted now. I just have a slide for people that um, can't hear me. I'll uh, pull it up in a second. Um, so it looks like 98% uh, can hear me, so that's really good. However, I've got one slide here up for people that can't hear me. Of course, talking to them won't uh, <laughs> help. Um, but there's some numbers they can dial in as well and they can check their speaker and headset. So hopefully the sound will improve then. Right, so I'm going to hand over to Peter now and he's going to start the um, presentation. Okay, thank you Margarita for that. Um, our presentation today five sessions welcome which Margaret has already done so I'll welcome you as well we're going to look at what big data is in terms of the definitions why big data which might be translated as what has made data big in the first place we're going to look at the processing of big data in with Hadoop in a very simplified format and then at the end we're going to get, show you some examples of using the Hadoop system uh, using Hive which is a component of it so, what is big data? I'm, I'm idea, and you'll have heard of all the definitions starting with the word V. It started off with three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety, and then people started adding a few more. So, I've got uh, seven there. You can probably find more in the dictionary. But we also need to consider where this data is coming from. So, we've got various sources of um, of big data, um, new social media, GPS, modern systems for generating data, many of them. What kind of data are we talking about? Well, big data is quite often associated with unstructured data, freeform, text, audio, video. Um, the, it's stored in, for, in different formats, JSON and XML, and stored often in NoSQL type databases. Further that, we've got the structured data. Now, this is normally associated with more traditional small data in these formats, but of course, if, it, if a table's big enough, it's going to be big data. And then finally, what can we use to process big data? There's Cassandra, 
there's MongoDB, there's probably many more, but the one we're going to talk about today is, is Hadoop, just one of many. So despite all, all the words and everything I've said about big data, perhaps the easiest way to think of big data is this little definition from Wikipedia. Big data is a broad term for data sets so large or complex that traditional data processing applications are inadequate. Or if we put that another way, you're used to processing little bits of data on your PC in your favorite applications, whether it's SPSS, Data, um, R, or whatever. And it gets to the point where the data is just too big to fit into your desktop application. At that point, you personally are going to consider that to be big data. Well, we've already mentioned in the previous slide that, that it comes from a variety of data. And one of the key things about these new sources of data is that they haven't been generated specifically for analysis. And in addition, the unstructured data is typically verbose in the layout and constitution. So you can also have a situation where the data simply contains more than we actually need for our analysis. That, that gener that's derived from the fact that it's not actually being generated specifically for the analysis. So we've had a look at structured data. This, this is the more the traditional data, um, so the tabular data and so on. Relational database systems like Oracle and SQL Server and so on all rely on structured data. So it consists mainly of, of tables where you, you construct a table, you give you put column names, you say the types of data that these columns are going to contain, and then you populate the table with the, the rows and rows of data in the right format in the right position in the table. So the disadvantage of this is that it makes it somewhat inflexible in dealing with changes to the structure. If you suddenly got a new column that was needed, and or worse, you need to reorder columns, then you've got a bit of a problem. On the other hand, an advantage is that you can perform a lot of validation checks as you load the data, because you already know what type of data you're expecting in a certain um, column position. On the other hand, unstructured data is free format data. There's no guarantee what data items will be included, nor the order in which they'll appear. When data is originally received, it's just stored as is. So you, you, you've you got a data source coming from somewhere, you read a record in, you just store it as it is. You're going to process it later on. And when the data is subsequently processed, then you worry about the values in, from specific fields. Despite the name, however, there is still some structure in unstructured data. So here's some examples of, un of structured and unstructured data. You can see the top one is an XLSX, an Excel, an Excel format, where you just have a worksheet and you've got your column names at the top of the table and the rows just represent the data. Um, the CSV and the tab delimited below that are very similar and very they're very compact. Bear in mind, they are assuming that having given the, the row headers at the beginning, every row of data that follows is in the correct format and in the correct positions. When we look at the unstructured data examples, um, some of XML, just let's see um, structured data. So on XML, we've got, again, within a header, We've got something called a column, and we've got clearly we've got a name QN, which is a column name, and we've got the PC column, and the HN column, and the QA column. But all of these column names are preceded, and afterwards they have tags associated with them: column and slash, backward slash, and forward slash column. And similarly, on the cells further down, each cell value is preceded and and, and postceded or anteceded or whatever it is um, with the backslash cell. So you can see. This format, although it, it is very descriptive and it clearly allows you to change things around a bit, it, it is quite a verbose um, system of, of recording the data. The JSON format, which is probably the most popular unstructured format out of thought, um, is also comes with everything in a row of data contained in the row row of data. That is, each row contains the, what, what in other terms would be called a column name followed by the value for that column and so on and so forth. So there we've got exactly this
same data represented in JSON. Now, the thing to remember about that is that the next row would again repeat QN in quotes, followed by a value for the next row of data, and so on and so forth. So, in fact, every row of data has the column names repeated. So, again, you can see why that becomes quite verbose. But it is quite a flexible format. So, that explains um, the verbosity of data, which can help make it big. Let's look at another example. This is um, a map of a, a trip across Manchester. The data um, used to produce it was recorded on, on a GPS logger. and You put your GPS logger into your PC or the USB port, and the software provided draws you a nice little map like that. So you can see where you've been. Very, very common application. And, that, and what you're seeing on the screen is tip, the typical use of it. But you can do other things with it as well. So the, record, the data that the GPS logger records will include a timestamp, a longitude and latitude value, and various other bits of the information. And it does that at regular intervals, every 15 seconds, say. Okay. Now, and it uses all that information to plot the graph, uh, plot, plot that table um, map. I beg your pardon. Um, what we're going to do, we're just going to use the longitude, the latitude, and the timestamp. And then we're going to take a, a bit of a liberty. We're going to use Pythagoras, and we're going to pretend we're part of the Flat Earth Society. And we're going to use that to generate some graphs of a different type. So the first graph is a sort of a speed against time graph. And you can see on this graph that at the beginning of the end, the speed is very low. That represents walking. And the section in the middle, up and down, up and down, up and down, that is a tram journey across Manchester. Pretty well what you expect. And I can also use the same data in the same way to generate another graph of distance versus time. Very simple graph. Starts off slowly because I'm walking. I'm on the tram, so I've got constant um, uh, speed. Get off the tram, start walking again, it slows down. That's all very, very obvious. The point about this is that if you compare those top two graphs with these two at the bottom, they look very similar. You can see the start stop, you can see me walking on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, they're almost identical shapes. But the bottom two graphs are drawn with only every tenth data point that was available to me. So in fact, by discarding 90% of the data, I've actually lost very little information at all. And that's the type of decision you may have to face when you're looking at your data. How much of it do you need? What can I get rid of? How can I get rid of it? And so we'll look now at another sort of examples and explain where the problem comes in. If we um, consider tweets, if you send a tweet, it's very small. I should just point out the scale at the bottom of your screen is a, a pseudo log type scale, just to give you an idea of volumes. There's no attempt to be precise at any of this. But a single tweet is going to be less than 1K. If you actually try to record tweets from Twitter.com using the various means of doing so, you'll find that a tweet, the same tweet if you like, is probably about four, four to five kilobytes in size. If you, for your analysis, you needed tweets from all of the tweets from a user spanning several years that are a prolific tweeter, you could have over, well over a gigabyte of data to worry about. But so that, that, that's not too, too bit of a trouble. On your application, your desktop application. If, however, you want to look at all of the tweets from a user and all of the tweets from all of their friends and potentially their friends as well, then it's very easy to see how this data quickly is going to get out of hand and we're well into the 10 plus gigabytes here. Or we could be if you've got lots of friends. Looking at this from a, the other point of view, let's look at some smart meter data. Here you're presented with a data set of smart meter data from whatever source. There is um, a, a source of smart meter data in the um, um, UKDS discovery system, so you can find some there. Um, and this is going to start off as a very large file. But this file, the data records in this file are recorded every half hour, which is possibly not what you want. So if you were to aggregate that smart meter by day, you can reduce the size. If you do it by month, you can reduce the size even more. And if you reduce it by month and just look at a specific geographical area, you can get it down to something very manageable, I'm sure. Okay. 
the point about this A is that if you were to put in a, an arbitrary line, um, sorry, approximately five gigabytes in this case, and decide that anything on the left of, of that side of that line, you're happy to treat in your desktop application. You, you feel you can process this happily. So you're not going to consider that big data. So you're OK there. And then anything on the other side is big data. Now, the problem is that in both these scenarios, there is an, a situation where you are in the big data environment. And at that point, even if you are subsequently going to discard a lot of the data, you don't really have any choice but to treat it as big data. And therefore, you need a big data environment to work in. And that's where Hadoop comes in. So Hadoop was created by Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella, 2003-2004. Um, it's based on the Google file system. Uh, MapReduce itself has been around for 40 years. And first came in the language lisp in 1961. And just for, for a bit of information, the, the, the elephant that you see at the bottom of the screen, which is the icon always used to depict Hadoop, it comes from the cuddly toy elephant owned by Doug Cutting's son. And if you, if you Google Doug Cutting and Hadoop elephant, you'll find lots of pictures of the real elephant, and you'll find it's a far scrawny affair than the, the beefed up one there, obviously done to represent big data. So let's have a look at the, the infrastructure of, of Hadoop. A Hadoop cluster consists of, oh, it could be thousands of nodes. Each node is an, in, can, is an individual computer many times more powerful than the average desktop. It's the same in that it has RAM and it's, it's got disk and it's got memory, but a lot more of everything. Um, the minimum number of nodes you'd really need to have a cluster would be four, but you can have many thousands if you want to, if you, if you can afford them. Certainly the likes of Yahoo and, and, and Google will have thousands in their clusters. The strength of Hadoop, though, is not its raw power, despite the fact you've got powerful computers in there, but its ability to break a processing task down and run all of the parts in parallel, effectively divide and conquer. That, that's what it's going to do. It's also built to be very resilient and cope with server failures, because if you think about it, although servers are, are very stable and don't break down very often, if you've got a cluster with thousands of them in them, the chances are one's going to break every day. If you go to um, hortonworks.com or several other places, you'll find plenty of diagrams showing um, well, in this case, it says the Hortonworks data platform. Other companies have their own name. But essentially, it's just depicted, this diagram is depicting a Hadoop system with various um, components in it. Some of them are essential components. Others are optional type elements. So we're going to look at this in a very cut down way. We'll look at HDFS. We'll look at MapReduce. And at the end, we're going to do a demonstration using Hive, which is SQL based. So that's our minimal environment. So starting with HTFS, um, to the end user, it's just a file. And later on when we do the demo, I'll show you this looking just like a file system. But internally, the files are segmented into blocks of 128 megabytes and randomly distributed across all of the, well, across the available data nodes. Whether they all get used, you don't know. You don't really care either. A data node is a serve as a Hadoop cluster where actual processing takes place, i.e., where your programs are run. So HGFS is going to place the data onto these data nodes, which are just big computers, and they're going to be run from there. The name node is another server in the cluster, which is going to keep track of where all the blocks of your data are. Because you don't want to do that, you just know it as a file name. Now, uh, just um, as an aside, if you consider what, what an ordinary client server system looks like, um, so on your desktop, um, well, in a traditional client server, which Hadoop is not, it's normal for the data to be stored on, on a server, like a file server. And on your desktop, you'll have Office applications such as Word and other things. When you need to edit a Word document, a copy is sent from the server to the desktop and you edit it there, when you finish, the new version is copied back to the server. That is, 
the data comes across is moved to meet the program. This makes sense because typically the MS Word program is many times larger than the document is edited. Now in a Hadoop environment, it's a bit different. So on the left hand side we've got the traditional client server and the data is moved to the program. On the Hadoop side, because the data is so, so much bigger than the program, it makes more sense to do it the other way around. The program is moved to where the data is, and that's exactly the way Hadoop works. It's one of the reasons why the name node needs to, needs to keep track of where all your data is. Um, the other Hadoop component is MapReduce. There are two parts, a map part and a reduce part. They're just names. Maps got nothing to do with maps, reduce, although typically involves aggregation if you just necessarily need mean reducer and make smaller. Um, they're both effectively small pro smallish programs, typically written in Java, but can be written in other languages such as Python. Right. In a couple of slides, I'm going to do show you, walk you through a demonstration of MapReduce. And there's a couple of things you need to know about MapReduce. The first one is it's got to be shown for completeness in a, any basic Hadoop type introductory webinar. The second thing you need to know is you're probably never actually going to have to do it because there's so many alternatives and the different Hadoop components and different things that you can do. We're just showing this to give you an idea of what you're missing or what you will be missing. Now, the scenario I'm going to walk you through is um, in MapReduce is, let's pretend you have a questionnaire of 10 questions, yes and no answers. It's completed by a random number of households in each postcode area starting with the letter M. And you want to know, by postcode, the percentage of yes answers for each of the 10 questions. Okay? So, this is what is going to happen. The storing of the data in HDFS means that it is automatically split into blocks and spread across multiple data nodes. I mentioned that earlier. The map process is sent to each of these nodes, which has part of your data, to process the block of data on that node. The records output from the mapper process are sent to a da another data node on which the reducer process will run. Again, both, both cases are just standard computers, big computers, where you're going to run a program. All records with the same key value will be sent to the same data node, which will be one which will run the reducer process. The output records from the reducer process are sent to a file in HDFS. Each reducer produces its own output file. So diagrammatically, this is what we have, sort of. Now I'm going to pick a record at random, like this one. So this is just one of the records in your input data set. This record was moved to this machine. Okay, this is a machine piece where all of these records are going to be processed. And the output of your mapper process on this machine is to simply rearrange the record so that the question number, that's QN3 in this case, is going to be counted as a key and the rest of the record is a value. Now, from your point of view, it's just reorganizing the record. The reason I have described it as keen value is that the key part is significant for the next step, because the next step is what's called um, a shuffle step, and that sends the records with the same key value to the same reducer. So this reducer, this highlighted area now is the reducer. It's just another data node somewhere in the cluster who has go, who's going to receive all of the question threes from your data set. And the, the job of the reducer in this case is to do an aggregation. So for each um, post of code that I get a, a record for, it's going to sum the, the, the records up and work out the percentage of yes for question three. And when it's done that, that record is sent to the output data set, and that's it. So at the end, on the output data set, we've got the percentage just records by postcode area. Okay, moving on from that, there are alternatives to MapReduce. But first of all, you, you really need to understand your, your data. You, need to only, you only need to use Hadoop for big data and big data tools because it's too big. We've said that already. You've got two choices. Either you can perform 
the analysis inside Hadoop itself using specialized tools, or you can use the big data tools to transform and reduce the size of your data if it's a, if it's a viable option, and then download results to your phone. Every desktop app application, and that is the, the scenario we're working. But if you do have to analyze it inside Hadoop, there's plenty of add-on products that you can use. There's, there's Mahout, which is an add-on to Hadoop. There's Spark, which works with Hadoop but is also standalone. And in Spark, there's something called MLlib, which is a machine learning library internal to Spark. There's also something called HiveMount, which is an add-on to Hive, which again can do um, data analysis type functions. So moving on to our demonstration in Hive, um, what we're going to assume is we want to reduce the large data set into something that your desktop can handle. For this, we're going to use Hive. The Hive processing language, which we'll be using HQL, is based on SQL. This makes it easy to learn, um, well, easy if, if you have any SQL experience, and even, and even if you haven't, it's a lot easier to learn than Java. Now, where are we get our Hadoop from? In this particular case, um, we don't really have a, a proper Hadoop cluster to work with. So what we're going to use is a virtual machine, um, a sandbox virtual machine. Um, these are available from the likes of Cloudera or Hortonworks, which is the one we'll be using. You can also get similar VM, sandbox VMs in the cloud under Azure or AWS, that's Amazon Web Services. Um, UKDS are currently developing a cloud Hadoop system and they also have an on-premises Hadoop system for secure data, but they're still currently under development. Okay, the, the environment we're going to use, like I say, it's a Hortonworks sandbox, it's on a, I'm using VM player on a PC with 15 gigabytes of RAM, Intel i7 processor. If you look at the ins uh, a guide for installing Hortonworks, will be on, the, on our website in a few weeks. The Hortonworks side of that guide will tell you that you need 10 gigabytes to run the VM. In fact, you can run it in six. So if you've got a, a, bit, um, a PC with eight gigabytes of memory, you should be able to run it, well, I won't say happily, but re you'll get away with running it at least. Now, in the demonstration, I'm going to show you the sandbox um, provided web interface, and I'm also going to show you a third-party Windows-based Hive interface package. Um, this package is currently um, in beta release and it's free. I'm not sure if it will remain free when it, it gets into its final release. Okay. Um, this is what we're going to do. Look at the data set, select and, fil select and filtering, sound, generate sound, ra a sample of records, a random sample of records, which is an aggregation, and we'll create a data set containing a subset of the data. Um, next month's webinar, what is high, we'll cover these in, in more detail, like loading data tables, creating tables, etc., etc. Okay. Now, this is where it gets tricky because this is where we go into a live demo mode. Um, just excuse me for a minute while I check out all the right things available to me. Okay. Um, when you first run your sandbox um, in VM Player or whatever, you end up with a screen like this. You don't have to touch the screen in reality. All you're interested in is this web address here, because that is the web address that you're going to put into your web browser, any modern web browser, and you'll get this screen up here. If you click on advanced, view advanced options, down here you'll see a reference to Hue, and this is what we're going to use. It gives you the address, you can just click on that, it gives you a user ID and password. Now I've actually already logged into Hue, and this is the screen that you're going to end up with. Within Hue you can access the various other components of Hadoop, some of which we're going to use, some of which we won't. So what we're going to look at, we're going to use the Hive UI, which is the Hive editor, so we're going to write, we can write queries. We're going to look at H catalog, which is where your tables are going to be stored, and file browser, where your files are being stored. We're not actually, we're just, we are just going to look at those, and then we're going to move on to the other system to do the demonstration. So if we start at the file browser, 
for user you, there's a, there's a breadcrumb down here, you see all the users, little folder icons, you click on a folder icon, it shows you the files in the folder. Okay, just, just what anyone would expect of a file system. Um, uh, Hive makes use of tables, so one of the things that you often have to do is create a table based on your, your file. And again, the interface helps you out here, it gives you an option to create a new table from a file. If you click on that, you give it a table name, you can give it an input file. If I say choose and pick one of those, or I can upload a file from, uh, from my PC. So it's, it's quite flexible, it'll do most of the things that you really need to be doing. Uh, we won't actually do it because we've got all the files in place for what we're going to demonstrate. The uh, query editor, you just write your queries in here in, in HQL. Select star from questionnaire, semicolon, very important at the end, and then you run execute and it will run that for you. You don't have to worry about anything down this side particularly. And then when you when that executes, the results will appear on the screen. Okay. Now everything I've just shown you is quite a complete way of doing most of the things you want to do. Um, but for this demo, I'm actually going to use this um, Dell Toad for Apache Hadoop, which has all the same functionality. Um, you can see here all my tables, um, ways of importing files and what have you. But from our point of view, all I really want to show you is these little queries down here, which we're going to run and see what happens. So I've got my questionnaire file loaded, uh, stored on thing. If we just do a select star from questionnaire, it will run that and it will show you all of the records in the file. So this is based on the example we did before. So I've got postcodes beginning with M, question numbers, a big one, house numbers, question numbers, and answers randomly generated. Okay. If I wanted to know how many records are in there, I could run this one, select count from questionnaire. I won't run that, I'll just tell you there's about 640,000 records in the file. The next thing we want to do is look at ways of cutting down this data. And the first way of cutting down is, well, instead of you um, asking for four columns, why don't we just ask for two columns? which may seem a bit trivial when I've only got four to start with. But if you've got a data set which has tens or hundreds of columns, this is a very important way of reducing the data down to what you actually need. The, de the other obvious way of doing it is to use this statement down here, which in this case I'm going to take all of the, all of the columns, but I'm only interested in the rows where the, PC, where the postcode is M65AU. So if I run that and let that run, you can see it comes back all M65 AUs for right across the board. Okay, so again, if you can filter out record types or record values that you don't need, then this is the way to do it. And obviously, you can use the two in combination. The next example is aggregation. There's a few things worth pointing out in this one. The first one is um, aggregation functions like sum and count and there's average and there's some st um, statistical ones like standard deviation you can use in place of or alongside or in association with column names the, the point the, the problem with doing that of course is that the result doesn't actually have a proper column name so this as statement here as total yes is effectively creating an alias for the what that column is, and so this is effectively the new name of that, that column when I, when I produce the result. So I'm just going to run that, did I run that? No, I didn't. So when that runs, this one will take a few seconds because there's, there's more work involved for it, um, but when it comes back, when we see the answers, we're going to have three columns. We're going to have postcode, total yes, and total questions and postcode, and they're grouped by postcode. So in fact, there's only one row per postcode, and I've got the total number of yeses in those questionnaires and the total number of questions in that postcode. Of course, the reason all multiples of 10 is because there's 10 questions in the, in the questionnaire. The next thing I want to show you is, well, what if I just want a random selection? I've got a very large file. I just want to take a random selection. I'm going to download that and see if that's any good in my PC. So here, the, 
this is where you do it. You effectively split your data set. You tell the system I want to split the data set on a number of buckets. And in this case, I've chosen 64 buckets. You can have as many as you like. The more buckets you've got, the less records are going to end up in each bucket. So if I run this one, I'm dividing by 64. And you can see I get these records back. And just note 9, 14, 18, 19. If I was to run that again, because I have put a value in the, in the RAND function here, it means I will always get this consistent set of records back. So if you need to be able to reproduce what you've done, that is the way to do it. Um, before, um, I should, well, everything we've done so far has just produced a result onto the screen down at the bottom here. But of course, in many cases, you actually want to store that for further processing elsewhere. And the way that is done is to use a, a create table as a statement. In fact, what I've got here is create table if not exists, and I've given it a, a name of the table and as. And the query behind it, below it is exactly the same as we saw before. Now, the point about the questionnaire postcode, it, the, if not exists, is if the questionnaire postcode does exist, it's not going to do anything. And if I run that, it'll come back almost straight away saying, yeah, that ran successfully, it just didn't actually do anything because questionnaire postcode actually exists down here. I can actually delete it from from this interface, but you can also drop them manually. So I've got a drop table questionnaire postcode there, and if I run that, it will actually drop that table, drop equals delete. If I run this again, it will repopulate it or put the same ones in there. Now, um, as a final example, I want to show you a mixture of what we've done so far. So we're going to create a table called questionnaire answers. We, we're going to do aggregation by PC and question number. And we want the, the postcode, we want the question number. And this little slightly complex calculation here using aggregate function sum and count is going to do our percentage of yes answers. So I've called that yes answers. And if I run that, what I get back is nothing visible because it self doesn't return anything. If I then ask to show me some of those records from that questionnaire answers which we've just created here, it will come back and it will show me for the first postcode it's got M658A, questions 1 to 10, and the percentage of yes answers. And that query encapsulated the whole of our map reduce example that we showed before. So this is a very clear indication why you really don't have to worry about map reduce because there's always far, far easier ways of doing things. Okay, um, that is the end of the demonstrations. And I think that is um, the end. So we just have a, a summary now. So let's remember, there may be no choice in using big data, especially if you don't control the source, which increasingly is the case. And Hadoop and big data tools are just that, they're tools. You're going to use them to get the data the way you want to deal with it. You can use them to do all of your analysis or to cut the data down to size in your, for your preferred desktop application. Although Java and MapReduce are available, there's an increasing number of other tools available which will make the processing simpler. And that is the end. Thank you, Peter. Um, that was very interesting. I'd just like to add a few things about the work um, that the UK Data Service is doing around big data. Um, we are scaling up for big data, so we are in the process of setting up a Hadoop system and would like to be able to process and analyze large data sets and uh, analyze safe, safeguarded and secure data, so all types of data with different uh, access conditions. However, this is very much work in progress on our side. It is a very um, complex project and uh, we will be updating users. So watch this space. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook. We've got a blog um, and um, an mailing list as well. Um, 
as people mentioned, we will be, will be uh, running other uh, training um, events. So there's two webinars coming up, uh, one about Hive on the 22nd of March and one about Spark on the 19th of April, and you can see them on the screen. Um, but we will be providing some more guides about this, how to download a sandbox, for example, to your own um, computer. And uh, we will have workshops. So to get the full list of all of our events, um, you just go to Ukidata Service News and Events and Events. And uh, if you do join our mailing list, then um, you will be emailed every time we add a new event. Um, and I do want to... Um, say that this is the first time we're running uh, this webinar on Hadoop, um, so we welcome any feedback. At the end of the webinar, whenever you leave the webinar, there's going to be a survey popping up asking you just a couple of questions, and we really appreciate if you took the time, uh, you know, if you had any comments or suggestions for improvement, um, please send them to us. Um, and we'll now take questions. Um, so thank you very much for attending this webinar. Bye, everyone.